It's not the most glamorous work, but a large part of software development is about setting up connections between different systems. That's all the more true these days. We've got the rise of the internet giving us vastly more data to deal with. And then you've got the popularity of microservices and cloud services giving us even more systems that want to be connected together. You have to be able to do that connection work to build anything of any real size. I suppose you could hanker back for the old days when there was just one big database at the centre of our world. But even then we had data integration problems. We just solved it in a more ad hoc way. Custom connection software each time. It's not the way forwards. The way forwards, and we are gradually getting better at this in the industry, is to build reusable tools for connecting arbitrary system A with arbitrary system B. Now, some of those solutions I really like, but they are admittedly quite big, like Kafka, Red Panda, that kind of thing. There's quite an upfront investment. Some do an excellent job with a very specific approach. I'm thinking of things like Debezium. If it fits your use case, fantastic. If it doesn't, then you've got to keep looking. But my ears pricked up recently when someone recommended I add to my list Benthos as a kind of lightweight way of getting some kind of connection up and running really quickly. Something I could add to my toolbox as a bread and butter tool that was more formal and more reliable than a shell script, but was a similar investment of my time to get something working. So joining me today is Ashley Jeffs. Ash is the creator of Benthos, and it's a project that started at his day job where he was creating a lot of data pipelines. And then the project went open source and got more and more popular until he hit that dream that some of us have. His open source project became his day job. We talk about the how that happened and how that journey unfolded, but mostly we talk about Benthos, the tool, and what it can do for you, the design sweet spot it's aiming for what it wants to be and what it doesn't want to be. We're going to get into that. But before we do, quick aside, I have to say the Benthos project has as its mascot a blobfish. And when we recorded this, Ash was sitting next to an adorable stuffed toy blobfish. And I couldn't resist mentioning it, but I did break a rule of radio in doing so. I'm talking about something you can't see. So if you're listening to this on the audio only version, Please imagine a man sitting next to a melancholy, pink, stuffed fish. There's a sentence you don't hear every day. If you have that vision in mind, we can get started. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Ashley Jeffs. Joining me today is Ashley Jeffs. Ash, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very well, very well. Nice to see uh, the company logo in the bottom corner. <laughs> yeah, this is a custom crochet from a fan. Did not think the marketing <laughs> spend is still zero. <laughs> As befits an open source project. <laughs> but it's it's nice that you've got crocheting fans out there. That's a very specific crossover of your user Or bit. family thereof, I think, actually, in this particular case. Oh. I do a bit of crochet, or I'm trying. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, that's that's definitely a topic for a different podcast, Craft Voices. But for now, I thought, so we're going to talk about Benthos. And I thought the way we'd get into that was something I actually use day to day. I have a script that goes to YouTube's API and grabs some YouTube data, as you might expect, given what I do. And it does a bit of parsing on it and shoves it either into Kafka or a SQL database. Mm -hmm. and Python... And I want to ask you, have I done it the hard way? Uh, so the, fir the first thing I would ask is, do you really care if it fails? Is it, is it the sort of thing that if it fails, you'll just run it again because you're running it as a CLI or is it on some server and you'd rather not think about it? So I do run it manually. I wish it were run in an automated fashion, but then I'd have to worry about failure more than I do. Ah, okay, so yeah, that's exactly where I come in usually because I think if if people see that they've got a particular script or like a, a, a use case that just does some simple like plumbing and they come to me and they say, hey, can we do this with Benthos? If they're happy and they don't really care if it fails and they're quite happy to run it manually, I will usually say, not unless you try and learn what Benthos is. Um, 
because it's it's just another tool. If you had a script and you're happy with Python, then you know why why rock the boat. But it's it's when you've got some sort of like plumbing system that you could. It's not necessarily a streaming application as it currently is, but in your case, you would probably want that to be almost like a stream where it's polling on some interval. Yeah. Um, and then spewing the data through, and you'd you'd have to think about it. It's just it's just running automatically. So I would con- some people would say that's like a batch job. I would just consider it a stream because it's hands off. You're not you're not hitting anything manually. You're not you're not maintaining anything manually. And the problem with doing that is the question of what happens if it can't send data to your database. What happens if it can't send data to Kafka? What happens if the transformations fail? What happens if it can't hit the API? All those things. Um, if you want a nice answer for uh, looking after all of those aspects, then yeah, that's when you want to use something more um, stream processy that has already got a nice answer for all those questions and kind of forces you to deal with them. Um, so yeah, the, those are the times when I would say, yes, it's worth learning a new tool and one that's kind of like in the streaming space, I guess, or, you know, like a, a, a workflow processor or some, some general data engineering tool, um, that's now mostly config, not necessarily script or code. Um, yeah, I certainly would like it to run t- for the data to just magically show up more often in my case. But it also, in, in cases where things like um, the output is just unavailable for a period of time, if that happens at three in the morning, you don't want to get woken up by some alert. So you want it to already have in its own um, mode of operation some answer to dealing with that, which obviously in the stream processing space is usually just back pressure and alerting if you've enabled it. Uh, but as this is like an opt-in thing. But ideally, you want to be able to wake up and see that, oh, there were some issues last night, but it's just it, it just carried on. Like it just fixed itself. It's, it's sorted. And I can see that in the metrics or logs or whatever. Um, yeah. You didn't you didn't have to do anything. Uh, it just it just resolved itself. But in cases where it can't resolve itself, like your database is just broken, um, you know, you wake up and maybe there's some logs there that tell you, hey, you've got to fix this thing. And while I wait for you to do that, I've just stopped myself from from operating for a bit. Uh, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I want to get into how you do that and what your design choices are. But I thought before we did that, one big interesting design choice you have up front is to limit the scope of what this does. It's not trying to do all database to data system to data system processing under the sun. Mm-hmm. Why and yeah. what's the scope? Um, I think, well, from the initial um, conception of the project, it's because I didn't I had a lot of uh, engineering problems where I worked that were basically in the single message transform space where you're doing like enrichments and you're hitting external services and then you're aggregating the results into like a single payload that then gets um, pushed along. Whereas typical data engineering tools are all usually catered around windowing systems. So they fit the the mental model of it's basically a database, but it's a streaming database. Um and I didn't want any of that stuff. I didn't care about any of that stuff. I just wanted systems that you can compose that will yeah. do enrichments and brokering, you know, uh, reading from multiple sources, writing to multiple syncs, and you know, do, doing sort of what, what would be uh, chores in the streaming world. Usually, people would just make bespoke tools for this sort of stuff, and then they would use like the bigger tools like Flink and you know. Uh, SQL over stream, whatever product you're going to pick for that, uh, yeah. for like the the big tasks. Um, but I wanted a solution that I could just keep redeploying with config that's going to solve the the what I consider to be the boring stuff traditionally. They're the things that you just like throw away to like a, an engineering team and say, hey, build a tool that's going to read data from Kafka and then hit our sentiment analysis tool that's owned by the data scientists and then you know remap the. Uh, data to to fit some of the schema, and then you know dump it in Elasticsearch or some database or something like that. I don't want to have to write that same program over and over and over again because ba- I was at a point in my career where I know that that's dangerous. Uh, you know, th- dealing yeah. with like writing the same streaming application over and over again, but with different code every time, you're gonna hit edge cases because delivery guarantees are actually super complicated, people. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there, there are these edge cases that it's not necessarily, if I'm writing code and throwing it over the wall, I don't necessarily care if the operations team have a bad night's sleep. Um, but That's terrible, but that does happen. <laughs> but sometimes they get so angry that they'll make it my problem. And then, you know, I do have to think about those things. So, you know, I, I was in a realm uh, at a company where we just had loads and loads of streaming tools that were doing all kinds of different things. And I wanted something that was just going to solve the operational 
uh, side of things. So delivery guarantees, uh, good behavior around recovery and, and hitting issues. And then the idea is that the, the bit that I will build is the ability to compose these simpler broken down problems. And there's nothing stopping you from adding complex stuff on top. Like there's no reason why you can't have a windowing algorithm implemented within Benthos. Um, and in fact, there is one, there's a, there's a very basic, um, window, but the point is that's not that's not what you're necessarily deploying every time you use it. So you can you can have the really simple use cases um, and start from there. Very very simple tool, and then it only reaches the complexity that your use case has essentially when you're like adding stuff to the config. Right. So this is making me think. I mean, there used to be this old thing in Perl, right? That it was the job of Perl to make hard things possible and easy things trivial, and you're mm-hmm. on. Of make the easy stuff trivial end of the design spectrum. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean the the initial use cases I had for Benthos were the most trivial, uh, almost like obnoxiously simple use cases for stream processing. Like imagine like we're just migrating from you know Kafka to Nats or something like that, where okay. you're just making a bridge, uh, maybe some buffering, um, and then the idea was you make that. Really, really simple, uh, especially to express in config. Everybody hates YAML, so you want to minimize the amount of YAML they have to write. (laughs) And then the idea is that every piece of functionality that you add on top of that, so obviously you can get more complex with like different brokering patterns, you get more complex with processing patterns um, and error handling and swim laning, all these things. But all of those features are introduced as just blocks of config that you can add uh, but you don't have to learn about it you could you could use benthos as a, as a user for, for years and not have any idea that any of this stuff exists and you definitely don't have to do any operational steps in order to enable things that you're not going to use so you don't have to worry about disks uh, and, and persistence and stuff like that it's, it's stateless um, and just memory based essentially and it's only if you were going to opt into something more advanced that you then have to deal with the implications of that and yeah, there's definitely okay. been a day one goal. Because it reminded me, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward to set. It reminded me a bit of um, Docker containers, right? You set up this sure. thing, you set up that thing, and you describe another bit that connects the two together. And hopefully yeah. you're done. Yeah. I mean, the, the, all of these sorts of tools um, were kind of up and coming when I was conceiving of the the general project benthos i mean one of the things that did really drive the uh, the way that it operates is containerization the idea that you're just going to have this one thing it's portable you can deploy it and also the idea that you can just deploy one of them um because you know back in those days if you wanted to test kafka but you wanted to use containerization that literally wasn't a container there was no <laughs> image for running kafka you had to like use all these hacky weird um custom builds and then it's like multiple containers you have to work out the networking for all these things and it was a nightmare from from like a dev- if you just want to run this stuff just to play with it as yeah. a you know developer researching these tools it was an absolute nightmare um so yeah, it, in the forefront of my mind the whole time when I'm you know building these new tools is the idea of like what does it look like for somebody to explore this tool? What does it look like for them to do a, a hello world uh, test? And right. yeah, basically if you can just do a one liner, uh, you've got a thing running, and then you move on from there. Um, that's the that's the high level goal is is you can get started with the very very basics. It works, and then you you know you kind of dig deeper into it. Right, that explains because I um I tried it out quickly because it's I without sounding like I'm pitching your stuff, but I tried it out. You do like Benthos create input slash processing layer slash output, and it'll create you a mm-hmm. config file. Yeah, and I just guessed. I thought I put you to the test, and you know, I was like input file slash I don't know. I said JQ slash SQL, I think, and it did just work. Created me a config yeah. file. So well done on the the developer experience, oh, at least the initial stuff. But how's it done? How have you implemented this? Uh, well, the whole thing's in Go, um, and that was basically just because I was having fun with Go at the time. Um, I was a C plus plus developer primarily, and then um, I kind of had this. So a lot of the tools I was building, these bespoke streaming tools I mentioned, they were all in C plus plus basically, um, mm. and we 
were I was part of the team that was managing all these different things. And there was definitely this belief of like it has to be C plus plus for this to to run as well as it does. It has to be written in C plus plus. And you know, I, I didn't necessarily um, question that myself. You know, I, I, would, I just figured it probably ought to be proven. Um, so I took one of the services that was essentially just a bridge with a with a buffer. So, you know, re- it was actually reading from 0MQ to Kafka and vice versa. Okay. Um, and then doing a bit of disk buffering on top of that with memory map files. And I thought, okay, well, how how much is the damage if I if I wrote this in Go and I did it in a really <laughs> cheeky way? I'm using Go channels because I'm lazy and I don't want to like have all this custom stuff. I'm just going to use the basic primitives. What does that look like for performance? And it didn't run as as memory efficiently. It didn't it didn't run as fast, but it was well within. I mean, it was something like a, an extra ten percent. Um, uh, okay. of time and CPU resource on top. And that's with like no optimizations, no thought process of like trying to make this fast. It was just what's the easiest for me to maintain. Um, and then, yeah, from that point onwards, it was like, okay, well, I guess, I guess I'm never writing C++ again then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, I, I tried to basically yeah, double right. down on this tool. Okay. But how did you, um, how do you implement it? Because you've got, I mean, it's one of those classic integration things. Your biggest problem, I'm guessing, is your two biggest problems are reliability and pluggability, because you want to mm-hmm. support all things to all things totally yeah. reliably. Let's start with all things to all things. How do you do that? Okay, so the the it's evolved over time, um, but essentially the internal uh representation of an input, the inputs are the more complicated ones. Uh so the the internal model of that is it's a thing that creates messages by some means. It could be you know pulling stuff over a network, or it could be making stuff up. Um, but essentially, it doesn't really matter. That's part of the plugin implementation that you have. So the Kafka one, we'll obviously be reading Kafka partitions, um, and the Nats one will be reading Nats messages. The file one will be reading a file by some scanner, so either lines or whatever. Um, and then the idea is that as it's as it's partic- as it's creating these messages, um, it return it essentially introduces them into a Benthos pipeline as what I call a transaction. Um, and what that is is a mechanism that associates a given payload of data or more. It could be more than one. It could it could already be a batch um, directly from the source. Uh, it associates it with a mechanism um, to acknowledge that payload of data. So from Kafka, it would be a mechanism that ensures the uh, partition is um, marked with the, a given offset uh, for a message. Um, obviously, that gets more complicated if you want to process messages out of order and you want to make sure you're not um, marking offsets that technically haven't finished yet. Um, yeah. But essentially, that's all encapsulated in the in the acknowledgement mechanism, and that's abstracted as just basically a, a function. Um, that's uh, associated with the payload, and then it gets pushed through a Benthos pipeline using Go channels. Um, okay. The channels mechanisms; those are things that you don't really touch if you're if you're developing a plugin. Like if you're developing the Kafka plugin, you don't have to worry about the channels. You're just defining how a message is uh, formed and how a an acknowledgement is established, um, and you know what to do if if the message is rejected as well, because uh, that will be different depending on the input. Some inputs have a sense of a knack uh, that you can push upstream, and then some of them don't. So you would just it wouldn't make sense to just drop the data because uh, just because it got rejected. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to make sure it gets reintroduced into the pipeline, um, and that. Essentially, that channel mechanism that ends up becoming the the uh, the, the lower level, I guess you'd call it, representation of an input, that can then get hooked up to any number of layers, uh, let's call them. So the obvious layer is the output layer, uh, which right. receives traffic. So it receives these transactions over a channel. And then for every transaction, it will try and deliver the data potentially multiple at the same time. So there, there could be like a maximum in flight that an output has configured for itself or a user has configured. Um, so you could have like 200 messages in flight uh, at any given time. And then what its job is uh, at the plugin level, if you were writing a Kafka plugin, you're just writing a definition of you receive a message how do you serialize that into the data that gets sent to Kafka? In this case, you're just getting the raw bytes and some record headers. Um, and then 
you either return an error or you don't. It either succeeds or it doesn't. Um, you can add a bit of complexity with batching. So, for example, you could define how to, rather than deliver individual messages, you might want to represent how to deliver a batch of messages and you be benefit from performance there. Um, especially in the world of Kafka, you might want to send a, a block of messages. Uh, and then what you can also do is you can translate an error that comes back. You can break it down by messages of the batch. And then you can return like an, a Benthos representation of here's a failure that happened for this batch for these given messages. So if you're able to, some inputs won't be able to, but if you're able to, the for, whoever formed this batch, um, if you're able to then break it down into just these indexes and retry the ones that failed and not the others, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, retry the whole thing. Um, and then once you've got those basic abstractions, you can then form the higher level ones. So brokering patterns in Benthos, you can have like fan out, uh, sequential round robin. Um, you can have switches for swim laning, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Those are abstractions around the channels. Um, so they're, they're able to do uh, pretty much real time flow control, um, and it's it's nice uh, for me as a developer to to benefit from like Go channels for that sort of stuff because it, it helps you when dealing with all the nasties, all the edge cases such as back pressure, retries, yeah. having multiple things in flight at the same time. Um, you know all the, all those uh, nasty stream processing problems you can basically solve with Go channels, which is doesn't make it trivial. Um, you're not going to solve it overnight, but it makes it a lot easier to both write and reason about once you've done that. Yeah. What's the word? Tractable. doesn't make it trivial, but it makes it tractable, right? You, sure. You've got a chance yeah, of solving it in a sane way. I'll thumbs um, up that. Okay. So um, I've, I'm trying to stack the things I want to dive into here. So the first is in order to get into how we handle errors, there must be statefulness, right? You can, if you've got a Kafka input, your progress through the topic will be stored on the broker. Mm -hmm. So you don't worry about that. But if you're reading through a file, your progress through the file, file isn't going to track that for you. So Benthos sure. must be stateful. So um, with the specific file input, uh, we I don't track any of that stuff. So basically the way that the file input works is it's not a streamed input, um, which means if you read it and then you crash the service and you run it again, it will just read the whole file again. Um, people have been asking for like watch, uh, watch mechanisms and things like that so you can like read it gradually but again this is one of those problems that i've just figured i don't want to solve that uh, i'm not i'm not writing a, a log aggregator um for example uh, you can obviously process the logs once they've been written into kafka or something but the the problem set around doing something like watching a file um mm -hmm. For the delivery guarantees perspective, if you want to do it properly, there's a huge amount that you've got to implement for that. So I figured I'll, I'll leave that to the other tools that specialize in that sort of stuff. Um, so the file input and Benthos is basically just how can you do like almost like a batch job, um, in which case okay. if you restart it uh, after a crash, you'll just run the batch again, uh, pretty much as you would with a, with a normal batch tool. Um, okay, so then with, that leads into delivery guarantees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so delivery guarantees obviously within benthos um the goal is at least once uh, as as like a core foundation you don't you don't have to do anything special and it will do it but the obvious caveat to that is that if your inputs and outputs don't support at least once delivery guarantees and obviously benthos doesn't um so right. if you're if you're writing data over udp stream then you know you can't guarantee that the data's gone anywhere and similar if you're reading data from standard in you can't guarantee uh, because there's no guarantee that data that's been consumed by Benthos has also been delivered by Benthos. It just doesn't exist. Right. Um, that's that's basically one thing that I'm, I'm quite happy to just sort of leave out there. You, you document it in the input that you can't really have an expectation of strong delivery guarantees with these things. But the things that you do expect delivery guarantees on, you don't have to think about it. It'll just work. Um, and that's really where my focus is. Right. This is, again, de delineating where the... De where this tool begins and ends. So let's talk a bit more about what happens when it does go wrong. Mm -hmm. Is it just drop the world and start again, or is it? can you do something more sophisticated than that? So it'll depend on your config, uh, but the you've got you've got different options in the stream processing world, right? You've got um, you've got reject, uh, so you can you can knack a message. So let's say you're reading from SQS just to get a, or get a, a range of Q systems into this conversation, but <laughs> yeah. um, imagine it's got a system upstream where you could, you know, you could have like a uh, uh, a queue, like a reject queue, um, a dead letter queue is what I'm looking for, um, 
And you don't want to just keep retrying a message internally in Benthos forever uh, if, if it's a bad payload, right? So essentially, the default behavior of Benthos is something reads a message, it goes through whatever processing, it gets to the output layer. Uh, processing cannot drop data. So error hand handling in the processing space, so say like mapping, filtering, um, all that stuff, if errors occur there, there's a different mechanism for handling that. The data itself always travels through Benthos. So if you don't handle your processing errors, messages that aren't processed will be delivered and you'll have to deal with it yourself. Uh, it doesn't drop data under any circumstances because in my opinion, it's easier to deal with, oh, we've got some weird messages appearing in our Kafka topic. We must have done something wrong than 10 months later, oh, we've actually been dropping 10% of our messages because yeah. there's yeah, some, right. pro, uh, some issue. Um, so processing is kind of like a separate topic, which we'll have to dig into. Um, okay. But assuming you know it, the data makes its way to the output layer, um, we attempt to deliver it. If that fails, the default behavior of Benthos is to reject the transaction that comes from the input layer. So if the input layer is... Um, Nats or Rabbit and Q, whatever, it will knack the message. Um, if that's not the case, so saying Kafka land doesn't make any sense. You can't knack a message because that would mean that that offset is just done. Yeah, you're going to lose that data if you don't reread it. Um, so what happens instead is Kafka will enforce a an internal retry and it will never acknowledge, it will never um, store an offset that is still in the process of, of being handled. So if you imagine... Um, you've read a, a message that's uh, too big to be delivered. It yeah. will reach the output layer. The output layer will reject it. What will happen is it will get knacked, um, and then the Kafka input will say, yeah, but that doesn't exist, so I'm going to pass it back through the, the processing pipeline. Um, and what you'll get is back pressure because the output layer will eventually stop delivering data uh, if it's not going anywhere. So you'll... Um, It'll try its best. If there's some data that's in like a retry loop and you've got like max in flight of greater than one, it'll attempt to continue to deliver traffic and you'll see like error logs and metrics telling you that there's data that's being not delivered. Um, yeah. But eventually it's going to uh, grind to a halt. Um, and the back pressure is obviously important because you don't want to be retrying an indefinite number of messages. So you have to mm -hmm. have some some number at which messages being retried and, and blocking the pipeline is going to stop the whole thing from consuming. The input will then stop being asked to deliver data. So it will then stop. And then what you'll get is Benthos will effectively slowly grind down to a halt as more and more data doesn't get delivered. And then you, as the operator of this pipeline, at your leisure, um, can come along and figure out, okay, well, why is data entering this retry loop? What processes do we need to add? Like maybe a filter that just, you can just drop the data if you want to, but it has to be explicit. So right. if messages are this size, just delete it. I don't care. And then you rerun Benthos with that new config, and it will reach those same offsets because it didn't commit them. Uh, so it'll reach the same offsets, reread that data, drop it, and then it flows um, like a happy fish. Um, in fresh water. And the, the idea is that every possible edge case fits some model similar to that, where the worst case scenario is you have a task as an operations person to you know adjust this config or uh, expand this config in order to deal with edge cases that you haven't anticipated. But the idea is that the data isn't just gone. It doesn't, it doesn't just disappear. Right. We don't just move on and forget about it. We make you deal with it, but you don't have to deal with it straight away. You don't get like an alert that says, oh my God, this whole thing is dying because right. the data is still in Kafka, right? It still exists somewhere. You're using queue systems that have delivery guarantees, which means it's persisted on disk somewhere, hopefully more disks than one. And you don't need to panic. Like ben, the stream processing world doesn't need to panic. There's no need for urgency in any um, form. Other it's than inherently the asynchronous, right? Yeah, exactly. You don't. There's yeah. no reason to to wake somebody up at three a.m. if, as long as you can process the backlog. So as long as as long as you don't end up in a situation where you can't catch back up again. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, if you're in a situation that's that tight, then yes, I would strongly consider uh, it a an advantage to to get ahead of some of these issues before they might arise, uh, <laughs> rather than just relying on Benthos to to uh, hold hold your hand through it. Right. But presumably, I could set up like a fallback that just sent it to a page system that texted yep. me 
as soon as there was yeah, any. So the the default output, obviously, if you've only given it one output, it's only got one place it could possibly read that data to. And if it can't, then it it will just uh, apply back pressure. But if you've given it a full back, um, so there's there's a bunch of different programming patterns, but one of them is if the first output fails, try this one and try this one and try this one. And because of the whole composure of, of Benthos, you can add processes specifically to outputs themselves. So you can have like a full an output of deliver the data to Kafka. All right. And then you can have a fallback output that's also Kafka, but there's a processor on it that says if if the payload looks a bit dodgy, just send this metadata instead. Um, so you still move on, you don't retry the data and the system doesn't apply any back pressure but what you've got is you've got a record somewhere that it doesn't have to be the same topic it could be oh, a different okay. topic like a dead letter so queue so i could literally just send it to a dead letter queue that's annotated with yeah. extra metadata yeah exactly so the the pattern is there for, for dealing with that and then obviously you can have more fallback outputs after that as well um so you know you could you could just write to standard out uh you could you, know, you could write dev null if you wanted to um or you could just delete the data obviously because because you can just put processes in there as well so you can also like have have processes that just like delete the data or you know send a, a, an http request somewhere or as you said like you could you could hook it up to alerting um if you get to that point and then there's there's other broken patterns so unfortunately we're gonna have to have this whole conversation again because as soon as you add um a broken pattern like fan out for example <laughs> The error handling has to look completely different, right? Because there's now new edge cases. So in the world that I described, where if if you've got two outputs, Kafka and uh, say Nats, um, and the Kafka is failing consistently, either because it's offline or or some of the networking issue, uh, but the other one isn't, you don't want to have a situation where a message travels through the pipeline, gets to both gets to both outputs that it's routed for, manages to be delivered to one but not the other, and then it's retried again and again and again and again in like a fast loop uh, because then you're going to flood NATs with duplicate data yeah. and you're still not delivering anything to Kafka. So w when you add an output broker that's a fan out, um, by default, it will isolate the retries to the output itself. So for example, if you if you did route a message to NATs and Kafka and Kafka fails, what the broker will do is it will keep it attempting the message at Kafka and it won't knack the message. Um, it'll just keep retrying to make sure that we don't do that busy loop. Instead, we have like a, a soft loop happening at the NATs level. And obviously right. you still get the logs and the metrics and stuff, but by default, it's not going to enter that busy loop. But if you do want the busy loop, you can have the busy loop by just adding a bit more config on top uh, that just essentially uh, would force the knack um because i mean you might you might want to hook it up to uh, like rabbit mq input and still have it delivered to a dead letter queue at the input level upstream even mm -hmm. if it did get to delivered to nats but not kafka um but yeah that's brokering there's like a bunch more right. patterns as well <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is all stuff you could do with uh, more sophisticated tools. I guess the edge here is that it's fairly easy to set up these patterns. Yeah. Yeah. Or so I mean, a, a config easy. in Benthos is you know, you're talking like twenty lines of YAML to have that broken pattern I just described with some yeah. processing on top. You could have that in like twenty lines of YAML config, and then you got the metrics, logs, uh, all the observability that you need. Um, Plus, it's portable. Plus, it doesn't need any access to the disk. Uh, plus, you know, the, the, the operational simplicity is stacked uh, massively in its favor. Uh, but yeah, you're not getting the the like the bigger fish like Flink, for example. The, it's obviously going to do way more advanced, super massive use cases if your if your needs are, are that. Like, if you need these super advanced window and algorithms and super efficiency on you know transferring and storing all that data, then you know, sure, you're going to need to reach for something else. But if you're use cases i just want to read some kafka enrich it there's like 20 http services that are like this interconnected network of things i need to hit i just want to store that in a file that my data scientists can edit um yeah. you know they can change oh it's not a post it's a get like you know yeah. they might want to do some trivial change uh or you know oh actually the payload is slightly different now it's, it's capital instead of all lowercase for this field <laughs> they can just go into a yaml file and modify that submit it as a, as a pull request to you and you can just you know click it approve um rather than them having to modify your code yeah yeah i'd much rather tell a data scientist to edit a yaml file than uh updates and kafka streams java yeah
Yeah, and yeah. we don't. We also don't leave you completely uh, out in the woods as well. I mean, it, it's YAML. Obviously, people do have issues with YAML, but uh, you've got a linter, uh, which is very nice. There's also um, a bunch of dev tools for for building Benthos YAML configs and like ha- holding your hand through the whole process. Uh, there's like a, an explicit schema as well. So I mean, if you, uh, for example, you can use Q. If you've heard of Q, C U E, Golang project. Yeah. It's basically a, a um, better configuration system i'm going to say uh but essentially it's, it's more advanced and it's it's much more explicit um so you could use that we generate a q schema um and we also generate a json schema if you want to use that to to help you build your configs out and okay. that sort of stuff okay then let's talk about the stuff around it like that so operationally what have you got for monitoring and that kind of thing so the, there's obviously logs um I don't like logs personally. I've never, I've never really liked uh, logs as a as a way of monitoring a service. So um, that obviously highlights specific issues if they occur. You can look at the log and it'll describe what exactly happened. But there's metrics for throughput um, and latency and and all the stuff that you you would consider important in a stream processing system. Every component that you add to a Benthos config will also have its individual metrics. So, for example, if you've got three processes are mapping. Um, some JQ uh, or you know some some HTTP hit. You're going to hit some service. They will all have individual metrics by label that you can dig into with dashboard. So if you want to specifically monitor the errors um, hit by your HTTP um, service request, then you can have a specific thing for that. Um, there's also um, uh, what do they call it now? The distributed tracing stuff. So I've got open telemetry support for, for oh, distributed okay. tracing. So you can use Jaeger and all that stuff. Um, that is actually really cool um, because you can you can literally look at a, an entire journey of a message through a Benthos config. So if you've got a massive, complicated Benthos config, you can literally see a, a picture of um, its journey. But personally, I don't really use it. I just use the metrics. Um because obviously I know what the metric should look like, and if if it doesn't look like that, then I want an alert straight away. Um, but then also, so there's no there's no like formal um, alerting uh, system in Benthos. What you would do is you would just hook it up as part of your. It's like an output for your config. So like you described, you could have a fallback that's just hit you with an alert directly. Uh, so you could have like a page or an email or whatever, um, okay. or you know a Slack message, um, and you know, things like that can just be glued into your config as if it was just any other destination. Because at the end of the day, it needs to have the same delivery guarantees, right? If you've got a message that's failed, getting an alert because it's failed is probably just as important as delivering the data itself in terms of delivery guarantees. So the idea that you might just not get an alert because it was kind of hooked up as like a second-class citizen of the pipeline that's like if you think about it, that's not really that good a thing. That's that's obviously yeah. something that you would probably want to address if you could. Um, so yeah, we just I just kind of treat that as like a just any other uh, component. Um, so yeah, the big three are the logging metrics and, and distributed tracing. Um, where does the the metrics is? How do you access that? Is that is that like does it come with a web GUI or? Oh, there's lots of options. So you can have. Um, you can have Prometheus uh, scrape it. You can send it to StatsD. Uh, there's InfluxDB. There's CloudWatch metrics. Um, basically, th- th- for those options, you're just it's just a config block, right? So you're just saying instead of the default of Prometheus, um, send it to CloudWatch this address, and it's like a, th- a few lines of your config. Um, because by default it's it's Prometheus, and you scrape a, a an endpoint that Benthos hosts. Um, but you can also, if you want to do things locally and you don't like reading Prometheus metrics, and you don't want to hook up an actual uh, metrics endpoint, you can just have it spit out JSON, um, okay. and you can do that two ways. So you can have it so that you can scrape a, a, an endpoint and get JSON formed metrics. So like you can see the counter go up every time you refresh the page. Uh, but also you can add. Um, the ability to log the metrics if you wanted to. So you can run Benthos as like a, a one-off job. Say it's like a batch job or something, and it runs to a file and then writes it to like Kafka or whatever. And then what it does at the end, just as it exits, it will spit out like a, a JSON block of of metrics for the run. So you can see like the latencies and, and things like that, which is pretty cool. I didn't add that. That was somebody else who contributed that, which I think is pretty cool. Okay. Um, I, that leaves me in contributing, right? So... From the list I've got, you support a fairly large number of inputs and outputs and a surprising number of different processing layers. Mm-hmm. Are you writing all those yourself? Are people contributing them? Is there a plug-in mechanism? What's the deal there? 
So I would say about half would probably me, uh, and then probably the other half of people just coming in and, and just adding stuff that they want. Um, and then there's a smaller number of people who are dedicated and, and they add things because they think other people want it. It's kind of like a mini version of me. Um, and the way it works is that, so there's been different generations of the plugin API um, mm. to kind of reach the right level of abstraction. Because obviously, I'm trying to make the config for Benthos simple for people using Benthos, but also then there's the, fl- the exact opposite end of the um, dev spectrum where I want the developers building plugins to also have a fairly easy experience. And it's mm. the same philosophy of if you've got a really simple component that works basically like all the others, you should just be able to write essentially just a function uh, for how to deliver a given piece of data or, you know, consume a piece of data or process a piece of data. And the plugin APIs are essentially designed so that you can you can define the configuration spec. So what does the configuration look like? That includes things like default values for fields, whether things are optional, whether fields are advanced, because you want to okay. be able to generate nice documentation. Um so you cust- you essentially define what the configuration for a component looks like, and then you define you know the the uh, thing that you want to do with that configuration as like usually just a nice a nice function, um, or you know like a, a struct that implements a certain interface. Um, and the idea is that if you've got a more advanced use case that needs a little bit more control for performance reasons or just because of its functionality, so I mean if you were going to implement a broker for example, it needs to be a little bit more to it than just a a function um for those you you would use a a sort of more advanced api that sort of builds upon the other one and then a a yet more advanced one if you want to opt into other functionality but yeah the the idea is apis yeah 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 so and most of those are internal so i've got like a public api um and that's the one that most plugin authors will use and that that allows you to have your own custom build of benthos with your own custom plugins and i would actually say that a huge chunk of Benthos users have their own custom build with their own plugins in. Um, and the idea is that they're first-class citizens, so you can generate documentation and it will be the exact same Benthos website as the official docs with your okay. plugins it there. Um, and it's all the same thing. Um, and, you know, the create tool uh, that we talked about and linting and all that stuff works the exact same with their plugins as it does for everybody else. And you can obviously contribute official Benthos plugins that way as well. So it's the same API. So somebody can write their own private plugin and then decide later, actually, the world needs this. Okay. And they can come and uh, basically just copy paste it as, as a PR. Um, and then obviously so there's internal think, ones. Let me think how that plays out. So I'm working at a bank trying to connect super ancient uh, mainframe to some modern SQL database, let's say. So mm-hmm. I write, is it presumably some Go code? Does it have to be Go? It implements your it, function? It doesn't have to be. It's a lot easier. Um, but we've got, there's like a bunch of a bunch of options. So Go is the best, I would say, for, for just really hucking into the, uh, the APIs for the config specs and all that stuff. Um, but if you want to, you can just execute a sub-process. Uh, and and just oh, okay. essentially read that. Um, not particularly good for uh, delivery guarantees because you're kind of reading off uh, just a stream of bytes rather than like a back and forth protocol. Um, yeah. You can also just hit an a- API. So I mean, if you want to, you can just run your like a, a sidecar service that exposes an HTTP stream endpoint, and then use Benthos to consume that. Oh, um, yeah. There's also some WebAssembly stuff in there. So right now, I, I think I'm pretty sure. I should probably know this. Uh, I've only I've only added in WebAssembly processors, so you can you can like define a WebAssembly uh, thing in whatever language you want, and then execute that as like a processor. Eventually, I would like to have it so that you could define an input or an output with that as well. But the WebAssembly uh, experience is a bit uh confused right now i'll say it doesn't really match the ethos a of, of benthos you definitely yeah uh, right but um, eventually i could write these things in rust i guess is my go-to web yeah. assembly thing at the moment that's the goal i think that's that's kind of like the dream one of all these like hip uh web assembly um, native languages the, the rusts yeah. and things you can stick them in there uh, yeah you won't get better performance i don't think but you know you can still do a hip language <laughs> go still counts as hip doesn't it no, I think Go is business suits now. Oh, is it? It's gone that main. No. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um, and so these private plugins I'm doing, this kind of sounded like you were saying I needed to maintain my own fork of Benthos. It's not dynamically loaded. 
It's not technically a fork. So you would have a, you, it would be a custom build. So it's a Go build. Um, and then what you do is you basically import Benthos as like a library. And oh, okay. you define your plugin and it like registers. You can have like an isolated environment of plugins uh, or you can just have like a global one. And then you basically call a function that's, uh, I think it literally is just run CLI and it will basically execute Benthos as a, as a CLI. So you're essentially oh, running okay. the official Benthos. Or if you want to get uh, a little bit cleverer, um, there's like a, a, a an API for building Benthos streams in code and you can have as many as you want. So you could like define a bunch of plugins, and then you can you can execute like multiple streams in the same binary and stuff like that. And you're essentially running Benthos programmatically with that, right. uh, which I, I do know quite a few organizations do because they they don't just want Benthos; they want to kind of uh, nest Benthos in their own kind of ecosystem. So they want like custom inputs and outputs and things as well um, that they might want tied to control over the rather than just like plugins. If okay. that makes sense. Yeah, I can totally see that. So I end up writing probably a bit of Go with a very thin main function in most yeah. cases. Yeah, yeah the, the main function is three lines. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, well, you've, you've led into this. If we're running multiple Benthos processes within that custom main function, potentially, we get into the <laughs> issue of um, kind of clustering. I mean, if I, if I want to do some processing that's too large for a single machine, Mm -hmm. Do I still use Benthos, or do I need to break out into the Meteor tools? Uh, there's no reason why you can't. Uh, basically, it depends on the input. So if you've got uh, Kafka, for example, uh, the default behavior um, is if you run multiple instances, then they'll they'll have a consumer group, so the partitions get distributed. Um, so even okay, if you so were you're doing backing kind of that like, off to Kafka. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's, it's essentially determined by the, the sources. Um, and you know, obviously, the majority of the ones in the streaming ecosystem, it just you just get it for free. Um, so, I mean, it's it's definitely been asked for. People will come in and say, like, "Hey, are you going to add any like coordination between Benthos instances?" And I always just kind of think, "Well, why? <laughs> what are you what are you doing with that? As long as you can fan the workloads out, like, what else is there? There's no state. There's there's nothing happening." Yeah, yeah. Um, if you care about, because obviously, if you care, if you're doing some sort of windowing, because as I said, like Benthos has like a windowing capability in there, right? Um, so if you if you needed to make sure that your uh, your windowing messages are all um, of a given type um, or like given group, say, um, you're already dealing with that in Kafka by the partitioning schema. So you're you're keying messages that are of a group of a window by the key in the first place. So, you know, you've already solved that problem. And it's the same with, you know, storage, you know, persistence. You've solved that with Kafka or Nats or RabbitMQ. Um, you know, that's an issue that you've already had to deal with. So, you know, why make somebody deal with that again by having Benthos instances have to coordinate? Because then you've got to yeah. work out, well, how am I going to enable that? Just use the the source, like use use your input. That's that's what it's for. That's what it's built for yeah and why make ash write it again <laughs> yeah exactly why give me extra work <laughs> that's fair enough <laughs> okay so another thing um that leads into you talked a bit about windowing so you've talked about enrichment i'm trying to get mm -hmm. the boundary lines here so you've got enrichment sometimes that implies joining different inputs yep. and sometimes it doesn't but when it does it implies statefulness so what kinds of enrichment can I do in a stateless world? Uh, so, well, the easy one, the easy pattern, um, and if I talk about this for, for, what, 30 minutes, you won't bother me about the more complicated stuff. Uh, the, the easy one is you've just got a single payload that is just the world, right? So, I mean, a tweet, and you want to enrich it with what's the language, what's the sentiment, uh, who's it mentioning, sorry, an X, uh, and... <laughs> You know, all that stuff, maybe you've got like a data science team, they've deployed a bunch of services that will do that sort of stuff. So this is kind of like Benthos's bread and butter. Um, because what I did is I, I replaced a system that was very um, stateful and handling all these relationships between these things. You have to do the language section first, you have to do the sentiment analysis afterwards, you have to do this afterwards, and then this. there's like this massive dependency graph of um, enrichments. Mm. And in Benthos world, the, you also have to negotiate each API differently. So imagine each team who's made some enrichment will do it differently. It might be a different company, it might be some completely out of your control. Yeah. Um, so the way all of this stuff works in Benthos is it's composed. So we've got an HTTP 
um, thing, which just does a request. Whatever the contents of the message is, it will be sent, and then whatever comes back replaces the message. Um, but then you can compose that within what's called a branch. And the branch will describe a way of transforming the current message into something new. And then you do any number of processes. So one of them will be your request. And then there is a mapping afterwards that describes how to merge that back into the original payload. So you don't, you don't lose the original contents of the data and you don't have to send everything out, which is a big, big problem for efficiency. If you've got this massive payload and you have to send it out to all these different services, you obviously yeah. don't want that. You want to just create like a subset of the message. And then what comes back, you're going to just form it back into the the, the new payload. Um, so it's kind of like this abstraction of uh, mapping, do the enrichment, and then map it back. Um, and then what you can do is you can take that Mm. that block and you can compose that so if your use case is complicated so you've got this big network of of things you have to hit um we've got what's called a workflow processor very loaded term uh, <laughs> but in this case what it means is you've got a bunch of these branches these enrichments that you want to execute and they essentially have like a dependency graph so you have to you, you want to do maximum parallelism. So if you've got a bunch of services you can just hit straight away, you want to just hit those all in parallel and then aggregate the results. And then whatever depended on those, you'll do those and so on and so forth. Um, and you can either do that automatically by allowing Benthos to analyze these mappings um, so it knows what you're using as reference to the enrichments and it knows what you're mapping back into the payload so it can kind of like build a best um attempt to work out what the dependency graph is or right. you can just make it explicit you can just add in a a list of these ones parallel these ones parallel these ones parallel um and then it will it will execute those things in a streamed fashion so you know it's reading kafka data for example it might be processing i don't know 24 messages at the same time because that's something you can tune is how many messages get processed in parallel okay. yep. and then each one of those will enter this workflow uh, execution little mini engine you've configured um and then all these parallel requests are happening and then you can make it a little bit you can add a little bit on top of that to be efficient around batching so for example you can create micro batches at the input level and then send those batches to your workflow and then the branches themselves can all have custom behaviors to whether they send out individual requests or if they create a batch. So say like a JSON array or yeah. line delimited messages or whatever, um, whatever the individual protocol is of those services, your uh, like little encompassed um, enrichment config can basically choose how it uh, handles uh, batches just for a little bit more efficiency than um, just leaving it all into like single message uh, interactions. Okay. Um, so that's the simplest one. <laughs> and <laughs> obviously it gets, it gets more complicated. So basically what I've done there is I've taken systems that I've already seen in the past mm. um, that have essentially a flipped mentality of um, messages come through and we're going to hit all these services and then each, each um, service is essentially a stage in a workflow stream. Um, yeah. So, you know, the output of one will be then stored back into Kafka, potentially, and then reprocessed, stored back into Kafka, and then processed again, stored back into Kafka. And it's, just, it's a pattern. slow yeah. moving pipeline. Um, and you've got, you know, potentially persisted data multiple, multiple times. Um, and what I've done is I've kind of like flipped that on its head and just said, well, okay, if, if realistically we're only talking like minutes to do all of these requests, you could just do that in memory. Like, there's no reason why you can't, as long as it fits in memory, and you know you, that flow isn't going to change because the the speed at which you can hit all those endpoints doesn't magically change because you've persisted it to the disk over and over again. So, if you can realistically just do this in memory, um, why not? And you know, the idea is that you've you've then just made this composed config that it's not necessarily, I wouldn't call it stateful. Technically it is, because it's got state in memory, it's got a message in memory. But if everything crashes and it starts back up again, it just does the same the last message that didn't yeah. make it all the way through gets reprocessed. A little bit of duplicate effort, you're not gonna notice it unless there's something really wrong. That's not an issue for most people uh, operating a pipeline. And if it is an issue, you can do the same pattern as before. You could do the you know stream um, one after the other approach because uh, okay. it's all composed. Um, so there's the more complicated thing, which is joins, and that is 
that's essentially something that at the beginning I didn't really care too much for because in, in my mind, like windowing systems that these data engineering uh, products were were putting together um, was kind of like a separate thing to something else that our team was doing. So the, the, something that I was doing as part of my career was essentially doing data joins through caching. So you might have like a, a memcached instance or um, Redis or something. And what you would do is if you've got multiple streams that you need to join, um, you read all of these different queue systems and you essentially populate the bits that you need from them into these caches and then you choose one of them as like the canonical stream and that's the one that you flow through and you basically hit all these caches almost exactly the same way that I just described all the enrichments where okay. each cache represents a bit of the stream that you need to join it with some other topic or some other queue system or uh, it doesn't really matter what it is but essentially you need to acquire piece of information based on some signature from the data and then whatever comes back you then want to merge it back into the 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 new payload that's being formed and then eventually you either make it all the way through or you don't in which case then the interesting behavior comes along where maybe you put that into a dead letter queue that's got a delay on it. And um, maybe that's tiered, I don't know. Like As far as you want to go, um, yeah. you essentially make sure that, that payload is going to be retried uh, if we couldn't find all the information that we needed. And what that essentially represents is your window uh, because you're obviously going to put a cap on how much time you're willing to wait for a payload to reach all of its um other pieces of information in the pool um you know maybe a day let's say yeah. that means your window is now a day and rather than having a conceptual window that actually exists where it's all one weird thing that's been sort of like designed to to work on a disk or s3 or whatever this conceptual thing uh, what you have instead is you just have a bunch of memcached instances with some info in it um that's not going to be anywhere near as efficient for some payloads. Um, so there's there's like efficiencies that you can definitely benefit from by not using that approach. But if that's not the case, and it's literally just there's a blob of data with a key uh, from all these different topics, and I just want one overall blob of data based on that key, you you can get away with it. You can you can have massive throughput, a uh, huge volume data pipelines where um, you have complex joins and you're not doing anything interesting there's nothing there's nothing going on there so your your operational job as as the person deploying all these services is to make sure that these caches are good so you know obviously you need to make sure they've got enough retention the disks are there and you know either there's um backup uh, yep. or you know you've got some of the uh, some other system in place for for recovering that data if you need some to. mechanism obviously, for repopulating the cache if it crashes exactly so you, yeah. you might have some mechanism for doing a, a backfill um if you find that some of those caches have, have died in which case you also need to have a policy for like how long we need to know how long that's going to take like realistic because we might never catch up yeah. um so stuff like that you need to have like an answer for um but as long as you you're comfortable with that sort of stuff then you now have a very very simple pipeline it's an extremely simple config for the actual busy work that benthos is doing and you know that benthos if if it crashes midway through a job it just restarts and it picks back up where it was um the data in kafka you need to make sure that that's you know replicated and persisted you had to do that anyway um but that's essentially where your data lives that's that's its real location until it's been delivered somewhere safely you're at least once delivery guarantees existing kafka that's just the reality if, if your kafka clusters all die and all the disks are gone your data is gone and that was always going to be the case um so that's the bit that you worry about in terms of like data retention the caches need to be alive uh and obviously kafka is what refills them um, if something goes wrong that's yeah. probably a procedure that's going to be manual right you're going to have to make sure that you're able to manually kick off a, a backfill in which case you'll have some procedure that the operations team needs to know but in my mind that works out a lot simpler operationally than you've also got this other tool that's doing this complex aggregation on disk that also has state that you might need to recover because now you need to understand what that looks like what does the recovery look like for that how do you make sure it's backed up how do you you know do all these other things um memcached is obviously lossy af um <laughs> so you know the the idea is that you don't have any pretense that that's a safe place to keep your data forever the the knowledge is always there that it's kafka that is the real source of of persistence yeah i can also see some argument here for um as long as configuring these pipelines up is easy there's an argument for having it 
you know, I can get you this join put together as a proof of concept within an hour, mm -hmm. and then it's going to take a sprint to do it in Kafka streams or something to make it more yeah. fault tolerant. Um, there's tremendous value in being able to ship it within the hour, right? There's a lot of people who use Benthos for like proof of concepts, and then um, what happens is they they have a bit of fun with it, and then I get them, and then they, <laughs> they stay with it. <laughs> There's, so maybe we should talk about that next, um, because this is, I mean, you're unemployed, employed, unemployed. This is your I'm so, so technically I'm self-employed, self -employed, but I'm I'm not a very attentive boss. Let's say. <laughs> What, what's it, what's your life as a programmer working on Benthos? Tell me about that. Uh, so so I, th I feel like um, this kind of this kind of situation because basically I live off ad hoc like support contracts and stuff, which was basically just me um, doing doing stuff to live until I figure out what I actually want to do, and I've just been doing that now for like four years. Um, <laughs> but then I also the majority of my income now is sponsors. Um, okay. but that's, that's an extremely lucky situation. Uh, I definitely would not be able to just reproduce. Um, but essentially that just means I can, I can figure out what I want to work on at any given time. Um, and with that freedom, um, the thing is like in, in a situation where you've got like an open source project and you are trying to keep it going, that's the number one concern. And the concern I don't have is taking over the planet. Um, it doesn't need to be the most popular thing out there. It doesn't need to. It doesn't even to be any anywhere near close um, for me to essentially get my goal, which is to live off keeping this thing going. Um, yeah. Essentially, my job is to attend the code base. Obviously, that's like the obvious one that everybody knows. I have to write some code every now and then. Um, yeah. But you're also evangelizing a little bit. So that in my mind, that doesn't mean marketing and finding new people. Um, it's developers that do that for me. Uh, I just make sure they're happy enough to spread the word. And my evangelism is making sure that the documentation's good and fun. Um, yeah. The uh, various support channels that we have are active. So we have, you know, lots of people in our uh, various chats. We've got Discord and Slack. Um, and, you know, if as soon as a question pops up, like we, one of us is usually on it within a couple of minutes. Um, and... Then you know you make make dumb videos and you go on people's podcasts and stuff like that. <laughs> but essentially, the, the way that my day to day looks is whatever I feel like doing is what I'll do because <laughs> a lot of the I just I like a bit of variation. I like a bit of context switching personally. So if I if I wake up and I just don't feel like coding one day, there's obviously a lot of not coding stuff I need to get done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you know, documentation, testing, uh, videos, you know, all those things. And yeah. what you're doing is you're basically switching roles. So I might be like a product guy one day, and I'll just have like a three-hour shower where I'm thinking of you know, <laughs> what does the next three years look like, and how are we going to get there, and you know, all that stuff. And then you know, maybe the next day I just want to draw stupid blobfish, and you know, I'm just <laughs> doing crochet like, them. Or crochet them, and I'm I'm just basically I'm just doing dumb artwork that one day I might go oh that's perfect for this thing, and then I'll like yeah. put it in my blog post, and I don't have to worry about oh I need some graphics for this. It looks a bit boring. Um, yeah, for a lot of us, this is the dream, right? This is the programming dream. Any tips? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I feel like I feel like open source is one of those things where like everybody can dabble in it a little bit, and then we all have this like pipe dream of like oh one day I'll I'll make money from this, and it's definitely great uh for a lot of reasons but also if you don't have the self-control to do certain things then yeah it ends up becoming a nightmare because what will end up happening you basically become a ceo but it's for a company that doesn't exist right so you can <laughs> yeah. easily like get yourself stuck in a situation where it's like you're basically working for free now on stuff that you don't enjoy so yeah. keeping the joy is the fundamental bit because you are going to be working for free and then just kind of like hoping that you can live off it by, you know, some means. Um, and if you, if you feel like you're stuck and you're, you know, you're doing stuff with no compensation and, you know, Oh my God, I need to get a real job at some point. Um, you're going to freak out and you're not going to enjoy it anymore. Uh, so yeah, it's basically an aspect of you have to keep this joy going. You almost have to, you're, you're not really your own boss. You're more like your own, uh, I don't know, guru or something that like you're trying, you're trying to get into your own head of like, yeah. how can I keep myself enjoying this thing? So that when it's, when it feels a bit tough, like there's obviously days where you don't want to deal with people or you don't want to fix this bug or you don't want to uh, handle this poor request or whatever. Um, 
that you need to kind of like get into that headspace. Uh, but then, yeah, the main trick is don't don't burn out, and that that means you've got to be able to like jump. And I think most most people would not enjoy getting to that stage. Like once you've got a lot of users. And mm. you need to be doing a lot. You have a lot of spinning plates. A lot of those plates are things that people don't want to bother with. And it it ends up not being as fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is obviously, if you if you can make it work, then yeah, it's great. It's like a, yeah. a dog chasing your own tail. <laughs> Every day I'm like <laughs> distracted and, you know, doing whatever I want. But also, yeah. you know, kind of being led by the world is essentially telling me what I need to do at any given point. That's nice because when you've got a large user base, you're not like living in a cave disconnected from the world. You've got these people anchoring you and keeping you sane, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we, we have like regular community calls as well. So we can actually see each other's faces. Um, on the very rare occasion, we actually physically meet in a real world space, but that's obviously very difficult to coordinate. Um, but yeah, a lot less lonely once you've got a big enough community that people can be around a lot. Um, and not just like five minutes every month when they've got a question. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. I um I hope it continues for a long time, full of joy. I have to ask you, there's one more topic I have to cover, and it's a little bit out of order because we normally end on the lighter stuff, but let's go just to something harder. The processing layer, right? I know you support, mm -hmm. you've got quite a few options, the different ways you can write processing, including ORC, Excellent choice for the old school kids. Uh, you've got JQ in there. I know you've got a few others, um, but you've also got your own language for that, right? Yeah. You're developing, yeah. what is it, Blob? Tell me. Bloblang. Bloblang. <laughs> yeah, Bloblang. So, why? Yeah, so the, I didn't have it for a long time. I didn't want to. I didn't want to build a, a custom mapping language, um, and. You can obviously fit. There's like brilliant code libraries for for JQ, uh, James Path, Orc, all these things, um, and brilliant people behind them as well. So I, I wanted to get those in um, because it, it unblocks people. Uh, you know, you can do like arithmetic in Orc, which was was a blocker at the time when I brought that in. Um, and obviously, a lot of people are used to JQ and things. Uh, there's like a JavaScript processor as well now for people who want to do mm -hmm. that. Um, eventually, I would like to have a Python one if we can. Um, I don't want to limit people's choices as to what mapping languages they use. And I, I kind of felt like it wasn't really my job to solve mapping or anything either. Um, the problem we had, though, is there's a lot of mapping that is um, very, very uh, complicated and messy for like big nested structures. The there's definitely a justification for having a, a language that specializes in that stuff. Um, I, luckily, I didn't really have to design that because there was um, there was a language called IDML, um, IDML, which is open source. It's a very very small project, uh, but it's a very very cool language um, that was essentially designed specifically for mapping. You know. It's either JSON to JSON, or it could, it could be anything. It's just structured data, really. And the mm -hmm. idea is that you can really dig into the nested, horrible, um, like massive structures that people are used to with a lot of enrichments. Um, you know, like where you've got like arrays of tokens or something like that, where it's, it's right. just these really gnarly, like deeply nested objects that you might need to zip up with something else and all this other stuff. Um, so I kind of had it in my head that I was going to eventually support IDML itself. Um, but it was really difficult to get it involved in in, in Go because it's basically JVM to Go, so it was it was pretty yeah. pretty messy experience. But then the yeah. other side of things is I didn't just want to have this extra mapping language. I also wanted to have it sort of like a native component within Benthos so that we can do clever stuff with it. So the fact that Bloblang is is essentially native to Benthos is how so the branches I was describing where we can infer the dependency graph of enrichments. The reason why that's possible is because the map to translate to and from an enrichment is Bloblang, and I can analyze Bloblang to see what we're we depending on um, right. as part of the data transformation and what do we create at the end of it when we're merging it back into the new object. So the fact that I can analyze that means I can then infer what's the dependency graph because I can see where, where does certain fields come from and who uses those fields, that sort of stuff. Um, but also, it, it was apparent that I, I can obviously support JQ to an extent, and I can support Orc to an extent, but mm -hmm. having a mapping language that I actually wrote makes it a lot easier for me to support people with really complex use cases because I can immediately see, oh, you can fix this, you can do this, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah. um, so from, from the support aspect, it's been a massive benefit because um, you know somebody can 
could be coming in with like a, a different use. They might have orc in their config, but the fact that I can just give them some blob lang that does something really gnarly and complicated, but it specifically fixes their thing, yeah. um, kind of frees me up. Then I'm I'm kind of unblocked on this this particular question. That's interesting because there are so many places in the design of this where you've solved the problem by saying that's someone else's problem push that out to a different system that takes care of it mm-hmm. this is a place where that's reversed and you said i'm going to bring that particular yeah. problem in-house yeah exactly and um, it's it's definitely a scenario where you've you you kind of made a compromise here where you're going to have this thing that you have to support indefinitely um and it's not trivial making a, a mapping language yeah um i took a lot of inspiration from IDML, so i don't have to design it completely from scratch and because i've kind of had a lot of time to mess around with use cases and stuff i knew roughly what it had to look like in terms of like uh error handling and flow control all that stuff um so I wasn't coming at it completely from scratch, but it was literally just writing language from scratch. Uh, I initially thought I was going to put it out there and it'd be like a niche feature within Benthos, and then I would probably just let it sit as that, uh, almost like it's it's just the way of querying fields, and that would be it. Um, and then I was, I was just going to see how people received it, because I don't want to force people to use a, a new language, because um, that's obviously the benefit of having all these different processes and stuff. Um, but people just used it like pe- people went with it and used it so i thought okay well i'll support it then i'll, I'll you know build it up and it's it's got its own plugin api so you can write your own blob lang functions just okay. the same as you write um other plugin types and you can also use it as its own library there's, there's a few few organizations that are using it as their kind of translation language but again it's, it's not really Benthos. yeah yeah exactly okay. so they, they've basically just got this thing running as like a library in their own applications um and it's it's not really something that i'm like putting out there as like its own its own uh project because i don't have the resources like i don't have the energy <laughs> to do that and i don't i don't have the energy to kind of convince people that this is you know this awesome language that does all these things um i'd rather just leave it out there and, and if people want to use it they can use it but it, it solves the benthos problem which is it's a lot easier for me to support people use it it's kind of like native to the language so it kind of ticks a few boxes that i didn't have checked until i made it um and it's not it's not a massive thing to to maintain it's not um it's not Turing complete or anything like that. So it's it's like a fairly simple fairly language. language. As far as languages go, it's yeah. easy for me to keep keep on top of. Okay. Okay. So if I want and if other people want to get started with this, um, where should I start? Uh go to benthos.dev and mm. there is a few options on the website. So you can either do a getting started um guide. Uh by just going to the docs or there's a video uh, where I, I talk about it. If you want to see more of me, um, <laughs> then you can go, go down the video route. I, I tend to find people, th- there's like different categories of people. Some people need a video to, to feel engaged in something. And then some people hate videos. Yeah. Um, so we, we've just got all of them. If you go to benthos.dev, you can find the exact thing that you need. Some people just want to jump straight in. If you go to benthos.dev, there's like five config examples on the on the front page for various things. So if you if you literally just want to copy paste a, a config, run it, and then start from there and, and play with it, that's probably what I would have done to be honest. Um, then you know you can just go ahead and do that. Um, it's easy to install because it's Go, so you can either use um, you can either just download the binary or you can uh, use Homebrew and things like that. Um, but yeah, Benthos.dev. It's Go. I'm assuming then it's Windows, Mac, and Linux. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. MIT license. Yep, I think that's all the headlines. Then, I, I think <laughs> I think I'm going to. I've got the rest of the afternoon free. I think I'm going to spend it trying to um, convert my Python script and end where we began. Oh, good. Yeah, you can send me the the script, and I'll give it a I'll give it a burial. Give it oh, a excellent. Burial. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ash. Great pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ash. And I hope you'll be sending me a toy blobfish when those go into mass production one day. As we said, if you want to check out Benthos, it's benthos.dev. But actually, since you now know what it does, the place I would start is there's a page that lists all the input sources it supports and all the processor types and all the outputs. And that very quickly tell you what it could do for you today. So I'll put a link to that. It'll be the second link in the show notes that takes you straight to that list. 
before you click that link, if you've made it this far, please click like and subscribe and rate and all those buttons, and the algorithms will then make sure we see each other again soon. Oh, and if you happen to be listening to this on Spotify on the mobile app, please consider rating Developer Voices. I don't know why, but you can only rate podcasts on Spotify on the mobile version. So it's an oddly specific feature that I have to make an oddly specific request about from time to time. And you know, I've been thinking about it. I bet there is some weird internal reason why it's set up that way. So if you work for Spotify and you can get permission to talk about it, please get in touch and come on the show. I would love to do an episode about the difficult realities of writing software at a company the size of Spotify with the user base and the number of platforms that Spotify has. I think that would be fun. All that said, I think it's time to go. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Ashley Jeffs. Thanks for listening. 